As developers, we obsess over frameworks, APIs, clean code, but none of it reaches users unless it passes through one gate, a gate that decides what the web can do, what fast means, what counts as secure, which privacy tools survive, which standards get implemented, and which quietly die in a bug tracker. That gate is the browser. And over the last 15 years, one project quietly became the default foundation for that gate, not a product, a code base, Chromium. It started as a small secret team inside Google, built in the shadow of Internet Explorer, fueled by fear of Microsoft's control, and staffed with engineers pulled straight from Firefox. Then it got an engine fork that changed the web's physics. Then it became so dominant that even Microsoft stopped fighting and moved in. This isn't just the story of a faster browser, it's a story about power, how it forms, how it hides inside defaults and how an open source project can still become the center of the internet's gravity. This is the story of Chromium. Mid-2000s, Google is growing into something enormous, but its entire existence rests on an assumption it can't enforce. That the web stays open, Google search lives in a browser, Gmail lives in a browser, maps, docs, ads, everything lives in a browser. And the browser market is still shaped by the scars of the first browser war. Internet Explorer is everywhere. It's pre-installed. It's the default. It's the gate. Inside Google, this creates a problem that doesn't show up on charts. A single company, Microsoft, controls the delivery mechanism for Google's business. If Microsoft decides to break compatibility, slow Google services, privilege its own search, or choke off distribution, Google can't patch its way out of that. Google can ship an update to Internet Explorer. So the question forms, quietly, in the worst possible place. What happens if the gatekeeper turns hostile? Google's founders have wanted a browser for years, but the idea keeps running into the same wall, the cost and chaos of a browser war. Eric Schmidt, Google's CEO, is wary. He doesn't want to provoke Microsoft. He doesn't want to pick a public fight where Google might lose. So Google takes the safer route, it backs Firefox, it supports Mozilla, it builds an alliance around the open web. But alliances don't remove risk, they just delay it. Inside Google, Sundar Pichai, then a product leader, pushes a harder truth into the room. Google's future depends on a browser it doesn't control. If Internet Explorer is the pipe, Microsoft can change the pressure any day it wants. And if that happens, Google has no direct line to users. The argument isn't romantic, it isn't about innovation, it's survival. And eventually, the internal resistance cracks. A browser project is approved. Not loudly, not proudly, quietly. Google doesn't announce it, it assembles it. The early team is a signal of intent. Ben Goodger, pulled from Firefox, becomes a central technical leader. Darren Fisher, also from Firefox, joins him. Linus Upson runs engineering leadership. Brian Rakowski handles product discipline. What gets built, what doesn't, what ships. There's a certain kind of tension in a room like this. Many of these people came from the open web world. Some have friends still at Mozilla. Google is funding Firefox, publicly supporting it. And now those same engineers are building a competitor inside Google. It's not betrayal in a dramatic sense. It's a shift in reality. Because Google is done being dependent. The browser problem of that era is simple. Everything crashes. A bad tab brings down the whole session. A plugin takes the entire browser with it. Users lose work. Developers blame the web. So the Chrome team chooses an architecture that feels expensive and stubborn. Each tab becomes its own process. If one tab explodes, it doesn't take the whole browser with it. This choice isn't just about convenience. It's about security, isolation, containment. The browser becomes a small operating system. Process boundaries, permissions, sandboxes. It makes Chrome heavier. It makes Chrome harder to build. It also makes Chrome feel like the future. In this period, the web is no longer just pages. It's turning into apps. And apps live and die on JavaScript. So Google builds a new JavaScript engine, V8. The engine that helps power the modern web is written by a small team led by Lars Back, working from Denmark, away from the Silicon Valley mythology. V8 is built for speed, aggressively. It changes perception. Suddenly, web apps don't feel like compromises. They feel plausible. By 2008, the project has matured enough to ship, and Google chooses a launch that doesn't look like a launch at all. A comic book, not a glossy ad. A comic that explains the architecture, multi-process design, sandboxing, the philosophy behind Chrome. It reads like a manifesto disguised as marketing. Then it leaks early, and the secret becomes public. Chrome ships. Chromium becomes the open source base beneath it. And the second browser war begins. Before we jump into how Chromium starts pulling the whole web into its orbit, 
Quick break, because what happens next isn't really about features, it's about systems. Chrome didn't win because Google outworked everyone, it won because its delivery loop was tighter, decisions moved fast, releases landed constantly, and bottlenecks got cleared before users even noticed. That's what DevStats is built for, except for engineering teams. If you're a CTO, head of engineering, or a product leader, DevStats makes delivery performance visible without turning it into another meeting. In the PR cycle time view, you can see where time is actually going, coding, pickup, review, merge, so when review time spikes, you don't debate it, you see it, trace it to the repo or team, and fix the bottleneck that's slowing deployments, and it helps you catch blocked work earlier. DevStats surfaces stalled branches and aging issues while they're happening, so you can step in mid-sprint before we're fine turns into we missed the release. It's enterprise ready too. DevStats is SOC2 Type 2 certified, and setup is quick. It connects to GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, Azure repos, and issue trackers like Jira, Linear, ClickUp and Azure boards with minimal setup, and most reports work out of the box. If you want to try it, start a free trial or book a demo using my link in the description. Chrome spreads the way. Useful things spread. One download. One try this. One developer saying it's faster. It updates quietly. It breaks less. It isolates crashes. It runs JavaScript, like it has something to prove. Then something more important happens. Developers start testing on Chrome first. Not because they love Google, because that's where users are going. And once the web is built to work best on one browser, the browser war stops being a popularity contest. It becomes an infrastructure shift. Internet Explorer isn't killed by one feature. It's killed by momentum. The web moves faster than Internet Explorer's release cycle. New standards appear. New APIs matter. New performance expectations form. Chrome ships updates frequently. Firefox fights to keep up. Internet Explorer starts to feel like the old world stagnant, heavy, increasingly avoided. Users don't talk about standards bodies. They talk about how the browser feels, and Chrome feels like the one that isn't holding them back. Firefox is the moral center of this era. It carries the open web story, it fights tracking, it pushes standards. But it's also trapped in a paradox that makes the Chromium story darker. Google's money is deeply tied into Firefox's survival. So Firefox is in part financed by the same company taking its users. That's not villainy, it's the shape of power in the modern web. As Chrome rises, Chromium turns into something larger than Chrome. It's a base layer others can build on. And that matters. Because writing a modern browser engine is brutal. It's expensive. It's relentless. It's security work forever. So smaller browser teams make a practical choice. Build on Chromium. Not because they want Google, because they want to ship. This is how monocultures form in technology, not through conquest, but through gravity. Early Chrome rides on WebKit, Apple's rendering engine. At first, it's a win. Shared code, faster progress, but Chrome's architecture diverges. Multi-process assumptions force deep changes. Google moves quickly, Apple moves differently. Over time, the relationship stops being shared engine and starts being shared pain. Coordination becomes political, and politics is slow. Google wants speed. Google wants autonomy. In 2013, Google forks WebKit. It names the fork Blink. Technically, it's a clean break. Culturally, it's a shockwave. Because an engine fork isn't just a refactor. It's a new center of power. Opera moves to Blink. Others follow. The web's engine diversity compresses. Now the world is trending toward a web defined by Blink and WebKit. While Firefox fights alone with Gecko. And this is where older developers start feeling the old fear again. When one engine dominates, the web starts taking orders instead of taking votes. 2018 brings the moment that seals Chromium's dominance. Microsoft moves Edge to Chromium. If you grew up in the Internet Explorer's era, this feels impossible. Microsoft once the gatekeeper chooses to live inside Google's engine. The reasons are practical, compatibility, developer priorities, user expectations. But the effect is historic. Chromium is no longer just winning. It is absorbing. And when Microsoft joins your engine, you're not just a browser project. You're the default foundation of the web. Chromium is open source, yes. But open source doesn't automatically mean shared power. Roadmaps still exist, priorities still exist, review policies still exist, and when one organization provides the majority of direction and resources, community can become a word that means outside contributors, inside boundaries. Who decides what ships? Who decides which APIs matter? Who decides which features are web standards and which are not worth it? In a Chromium-dominant world, those decisions ripple into everything. Extensions are where users claw back control, ad blockers, anti-trackers, script tools, privacy defenses, so when Chrome changes the extension platform, it's not a normal developer update, it's policy. Manifest v3 is introduced as a security and performance improvement, but the practical outcome, as many developers and users experience it, is a reduction in what certain powerful blockers can do. To Google, it's modernization. To critics, it's a conflict of interest wrapped in a platform migration. 
And this controversy cuts deep because it touches the core distrust. Google's largest business is advertising. So when ad blocking gets weaker, even accidentally, people don't assume it's an accident. They assume it's incentive. Third-party cookies are collapsing under pressure. Safari and Firefox block aggressively. Regulators are watching. Chrome can't sit still. So Google proposes Privacy Sandbox, a set of new ideas meant to preserve advertising while claiming to reduce invasive tracking. Flock appears. It sparks backlash. It's replaced. But the controversy doesn't vanish because it isn't only about one proposal. It's about who gets to define privacy for the web. If the dominant browser designs the replacement for cookies, it can shape the market. Not just the user experience, the business model of the internet. At one point, Google restricts access to certain Chrome services from third-party Chromium browsers. No drama, no grand announcement. Just a line drawn. And for anyone building a browser on Chromium, it reinforces the reality. You can use the engine. You don't necessarily inherit the ecosystem privileges. Chromium is a foundation. Chrome is a walled city built on top of it. Then comes a proposal that triggers a very specific fear. Web environment integrity, a concept framed around fighting fraud, verifying client environments. Critics call it DRM for the web, because if the web shifts toward attestation, if sites demand proof that your browser is valid, then alternative browsers, accessibility tools, research builds, even privacy-enhanced forks can be pushed to the margins. Even if that isn't the stated goal, the mechanism creates the possibility. And in this story, possibility is enough to create panic, because the dominant engine doesn't need to ship a dictatorship, it just needs to ship the lever. The backlash is fierce, the idea is pulled back, but the scar remains. Mozilla stays outside Chromium, it pays for it. Market share declines, influence shrinks, budgets tighten. But Firefox remains the last major independent engine fighting for a web that isn't defined by Blink by default. It becomes the web's conscience, still pushing privacy, resisting certain tracking models, reminding developers and regulators that diversity matters. Not because variety is cute, because monopoly is fragile. And when the foundation cracks, everyone falls. In the shadows of the mainstream, forks appear, ungoggled Chromium, and other hardened builds, strip Google integrations, remove default ties, aim for something like Chromium without Google. These projects don't dominate market share. That's not the point. They are symptoms. They exist because a portion of the developer world no longer trusts the default path. Chromium made browsers faster, more stable, more secure. It accelerated web standards. It made modern web apps possible at the scale people now take for granted. It also concentrated the web. And concentration changes incentives. It changes what standard means. It changes what privacy becomes. It changes how much power one company holds over the shape of the internet, even without explicitly asking for it. Chromium began as a rebellion against the old gatekeeper. Now it is the gate. Somewhere, someone is sketching a browser again. Not because Chrome is evil. Not because Chromium is doomed. But because every monoculture eventually creates its counterforce. The next fight won't be over who loads pages faster. It'll be over who defines the rules. Over whether the web remains a negotiated commons, messy, diverse, frustrating, free, or whether it becomes a platform where open means you can read the code, but the direction is already decided. Chromium's story isn't finished, because the browser wars didn't end. They just moved deeper into engines, APIs, defaults, and silent updates. And now the question isn't which browser do you use? The question is, who gets to decide what the web is allowed to be?